Okay, I'm recording. I forgot to do that earlier. Thank you, Kelem, for reminding me. We have Kelem Manuel. She is the president of the International Women's Coffee Alliance, the global organization. Thank you, Kelem, for being with us today. So, thank you so much. So, I am recording now. I just presented uh, Sunalini Menon from India, Omar Mo from Myanmar, Doreen Bringuaye from Uganda, and Bettina Grace from Philippines. So, uh, with that said, thank you so much, Sunalini. You have the screen, and can you unmute yourself, or should I do that? I should do that, I think. I can do that. You can do that. Okay, we can hear you. Yes. Beg your pardon? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. So, greetings, namaste from India. I'm Sunalini Menon, and I will be presenting to you the Robusta coffee from the Indian perspective. At the outset, I would like to thank, uh, you know, Sasita very much, but I also like to thank Blanka, Kellum, IWCA, and uh, all those who are attending this uh, webinar on Robusta. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for inviting me to make this presentation. I think regarding the time, I just wanted to ask you, Blanka, there's been a little bit of a confusion on the time frame. Is that okay? This morning I did send a message to a Pasita saying, is it okay if you speak for 14 to 15 minutes considering that uh, the other two co-panelists have prepared beautiful slides which could take some time. So if you would permit me, then I could, you know, make the presentation for a slightly longer period of time than 10 minutes, if that is acceptable to you. I think so. Okay. Yes, please. All right. So coming back to Robusta, I always, you know, love to call Robusta my ugly duckling. I call it the ugly duckling because if you read the story, the ugly duckling ultimately discovered its true identity to be a very beautiful and captivating form. Hi, can you do it? I'm sorry, I can't. I yeah. can't. Yes, it's a, there is a noise there. It's a, an echo. But I silent everyone and... Okay, I also si silent you, Sunalini. I'm sorry. You have to unmute yourself again. All right. Okay, let's All try right. again. Thank so, you. Coming back to this, um, you know, I, as I mentioned earlier, I always considered Robusta as the ugly duckling. And I'm sure uh, we are now beginning to see its transformation. I mean, the very fact that you're holding a webinar itself proves the point that Robusta is slowly being recognized not as a poor cousin of Arabica, I love to use that line, and also not as a coffee which is woody or dirty or stale or rancid. Well, I think the introducing origins have given scope for that particular descriptor, but I think today there are some beautiful coffees in the market coming from different countries, and these are now occupying quite a bit of a center stage in, in the world market. Coming to the Indian Robusta, uh, I think all of you are aware that India is a tropical country and the climate, the topography, the environment are not very conducive to the cultivation of the Robusta, of the of coffee species, I mean, coffee by itself. Uh, unlike tea, which uh, India grows in abundance and known in the world market as the number one producer of quality tea. Having said that, well, the challenges are uh, numerous in India, whether it's Arabica or Robusta. We have pests and diseases. And in fact, we are now battling with the disease of uh, the white stem border in Arabica, and the climate change is not helping in any way. As for Robusta, yes, we have uh, issues like the short hole border. We have, fortunately, uh, the leaf rust seems to be uh, you know, not too fond of the Robusta but we have a large number of pests and diseases. 
So how did we tackle this? I think that is an interesting arena. We have a very, very good research station called the Central Coffee Research Station, which is located in the coffee growing region, very close to Chikmagalo, which is one of the prime spot coffee growing areas in India. Now, we don't get much aid. In fact, we hardly have any aid coming in from anywhere. The aid that is given to this research station is come out of the exports of our coffee from India. The government returns some of this, they maybe a test, and the test comes back to us, and then the research goes on. So the research has been carried out extremely well, and I'll talk about the various strains very shortly. Coming to uh, the aspect of uh, you know how coffee came into India, let me just give you a short synopsis of it. Uh, in fact, in 1860, Arabica came into our country. The story is a beautiful story. Uh, a saint by the name of Baba Budan is said to have brought in seven seeds uh, on his return from a pilgrimage to Mecca. He planted it around his hut in Chikmagalore from where coffee cultivation spread to the rest of India. Coffee cultivation got started. But then came the 1900s, and the Arabica got devastated by Libra. So at that point in time, India heard that there was a good robusta strain in Sri Lanka called the Terebinia strain, named after the beautiful garden called the famous garden called Terebinia in Sri Lanka. So in 1905, this strain came into India, but alas, Sri Lanka gave up growing robusta because they got attacked by lots of diseases, including Lisa. However, this Terebinia came into India. It came into Kerala, which is a southern state, and it started being cultivated there. Just to give you a little bit about the coffee growing regions in India, it's mainly in the south. We have Karnataka, where I live, that's the state where I live. With Bangalore, the city where I live, is, uh, is the, called the coffee capital in India. And then uh, we have in Kerala, where I just talked about the robustas, which is uh, an area which is also now cultivating some good quality arabicas. And we have Tamil Nadu, little bit of pockets in a non-traditional belt, again in the south, called Andhra Pradesh and a small belt, a tribal belt, in the northeastern part of India. We produce about 5.8 million bags of coffee. And when we started off production, the ratio between Arabica and Devastra was 50 to 50. But unfortunately, due to the ravages of pests, diseases, due to climate change, this ratio has got altered to 60-40 and maybe it may even come down a little bit more, but we are hoping that with the research that is being carried out, especially on the white stem border, we would be in a position to reinstate the Arabica you know, on a larger scale in India. Now, coming to the, uh, the positives in our robustas, one, uh, as, as I always believe, it starts with the genetic material. The genetic material is excellent. We also have, we do not have altitude. I mean, you know, when you talk about Tanzania, you can go as high as 6,000, 7,000 feet where coffee is cultivated. You come to India, most of it is between 3,500 and 4,000. But we find that our robusta can be cultivated, you know, very well, even at an altitude of 4,800 feet. Now, another interesting aspect is we grow our coffee under shade, be it Arabica or be it Robusta. It may be a necessity, but then it has helped to sustain our plantations. It has helped in carbon sequestration. It has helped in preserving the flora, the fauna, the animal life, which is so varied in India. I still remember going to a farm and I was just telling the farmer, why is this fox, uh, why is this uh, dog following me? And he told me, ma'am, it's not a dog, it's a fox. And I said, oh my God, it's a fox. And then, you know, I looked at it and said, yeah, it is a fox. So we have lots of elephants. Now there's a lot of conflict, uh, man-elephant conflict, but we are resolving it in without harming the elephant. So in spite of all this, we have such a beautiful flora and fauna. And then we come into the processing. Now that's had a backseat uh, for a long time. 
But then the farmer, when the market got liberalized for marketing of coffee, which was opened up in the year 1996, to be precise, it was end 1995, commencement of 1996, the government uh, requested the Coffee Board of India to divest itself from marketing of coffee. They are handling other aspects like promotion, research, extension, but the marketing today is done by the farmer. So I think that is a good move because then processing started taking, uh, you know, a, a front, became the front runner for quality. So processing, uh, and lastly, of course, is how you market and promote your coffee, which again is not very well developed in India, unlike in other parts of the world, like Guatemala, for instance, you know, you market it in such a beautiful way, and you know, you go by regions, and I can just visualize colors and the flavors with each of the regions. My favorite is Fiji Panango, I just love those two, you know. So this is something which is an arena which we need to really develop. So coming to, in our, in my opinion, there are four important factors which I'm going to talk about as to how we develop this, uh, I can't use the word fine, I probably would be on a safer bet to say good, high quality, robustness. I'm always very nervous to use the word fine. I would rather have my buyer tell me, oh my God, this is a fine robusta, and I'm hoping that he will say it's a specialty robusta. You know, it's, it's very sad, but robusta is called a fine robusta, whereas Arabica is called a specialty robusta. And, you know, I, I also was a part of that, uh, uh, you know, when they're drawing up the standard. And though I tried to say, why not we use a specialty? They said, you know, you remember, we've given you a concession, you brought Robusta to the table and we are preparing the standard for Robusta. I still remember sitting in UCBA uh, along with the CQI and I said, okay, I'm happy with fine Robusta, but I hope someday we'll have a specialty Robusta. So coming to the first aspect, which I think contributes, as I mentioned earlier, is your plant material. And uh, one of the nicest things in India is that when Robusta came in, the farmer realized that this is also an income earner. So they started treating Arabica and Robusta as equal partners. They were equal income earners. And I think that has stood the test of time for us, being treated as equals, the same attention to, to the uh, cultivation, to the uh, processing, and to the marketing. So that's a very important point. Coming to plant materials, the Central Coffee Research Station found there were very many problems in India. They found that, you know, one was the, uh, there was the genetic material was very limited, Robusta is self incompatible, and they found that it cannot stand drought, and they felt that it, they realized that it takes years to stabilize it, and they also found that they had to improve the liquor and cupping, the liquoring or the cupping quality. But due to their human work, we have three very interesting strains being cultivated in India. The first one, which was the Parabinia, improved upon, which has got distinctive flavors of caramel and chocolate and malt. And then they worked on that. And an offspring of Parabinia is Selection 274. They're not very romantic, unfortunately. We only have numbers. They're all great math wizards. So we have the 274 which has got caramel, which has got chocolate, which has got malt, which got toasted nuts and spices. That was the addition that was done. And then came this, the most beautiful strain, which the farmer is now cultivating in a very big way, which is the congenesis into Robusta. It was brought in from the Congo region, the congenesis, crossed with the Coffea Robusta. You know, robusta can exist in many, many forms, and that's the beauty of this. You can have Xenophila paris, which has got purple fruits. You can have Bukovensis, which grows in the Bukova region of Tanzania. You have so many forms of robusta. So they crossed it with the uh, robusta, not with the Canifora. They crossed it with the robusta, and this has got delicious fruit notes. It's got a very smooth, soft, buttery uh, mouthfeel. It's got sweetness, and the aftertaste is the most interesting. The bitterness gets subdued. It's not that the caffeine has come down or the chlorogenic acid has come down, but it's just that the sweetness and the brightness overpower. 
So again, worked on the organic acid in this particular case. Now coming to the next uh, point, which I think is a great contributor, is I think the altitude. Uh, 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 fortunately for us, our robust strains can grow even at higher altitudes. The same experience as the Arabica, it takes a longer while to grow and uh, you know, it takes a longer while to mature. But we found that there was a lower potassium content at the higher altitude. We also found that there was a better development of organic acid in the higher altitude. The sugar content was also better, the sucrose content. So we found that the altitude uh, also uh, seems to have an effect on the cup quality of the coffee strain. And today we are also finding that the soil conditions in relation to the altitude plays a very major part in developing distinctive flavors. Uh, I mean, I cannot say that uh, a parabenia, which grows in perhaps in the region of Tour, which is the largest producer of robusta, has a better flavor profile. It has more of a certain attribute, which is the mouth feel. If I go into an altitude of 4,500, the attribute of brightness improves that profile of that particular strain of coffee. So these intrinsic notes, these various attributes other than flavor will also get accentuated depending on the region where the coffee was cultivated. We come next to a very interesting concept which we have seen in our country, which is the shade pattern. The type of shade tree seems to have an effect on the cup quality. Now, there is no scientific confirmation of this observation, but I still remember walking into a farm and I walked into a particular field and I said, hey, the smell in this field is so different. And he said, no, it's the same strain as the adjoining field, the same strain of robusta. But when I looked up, I found that the entire field had been planted with a caterpillar fruit and that was contributing to that particular smell. So I started cupping that separately and I found that it had delicious fruit notes. It had dates and it had figs. So maybe something to do with the shade tree. What is going on? You know, we also have a diversified pattern of cultivation in India. We grow a lot of pepper and we find that in some of the farms, the pepper plants can, can be seen winding on the stem of the robusta and we find that that also seems to have, you know, those coffee seem to have a spice note in the cup. This again, not confirmed by scientific, uh, you know, explanation. Now coming to the important aspect of processing, as I mentioned to you, the farmer gives the same attention to both the radicals and robustas. Now we were only preparing unwashed robusta to start with. And then in the 1985, I still remember I was working in the coffee board of India, we said, let's make washed robusta. And there was such a protest from the coffee farmer saying, listen, we've been treating both Arabica and robusta as equal partners, but we don't get as much money from our robusta as we get from Arabica. So we said, yeah, but you're preparing more of washed uh, Arabica than washed robusta. I mean, you're not preparing any washed robusta. So that, and we said, we'll pay you extra because we were doing the marketing. We said, we'll pay it on top quality. That started the entire movement, and today we make about 25% of washed robusta. And this coffee, I can assure all the berry producing origin, make washed robusta, and you will find a completely different, very interesting taste profile. Now, I'd like to divide the processing techniques into two arenas. One is a traditional method of processing, and the other is an innovative way of processing. Traditional is the usual. In India, we just do in pulping, we do fermentation, we do washing, we do soaking. But today, if you look around, I'm sure all my other producing uh, origins will confirm that they're looking at carbonic maturation. They are looking at using, using yeast. They're looking at using enzymes. So I think this is another beautiful journey to embark on. And I think we now should start experimenting with this aspect of uh, processing. And of course, the last important point is promotion and marketing. I'll come to that a little later. I just want to give you a brief on the uses for robusta before I wind up. And the uses would be, remember all of us who produce robusta, we are growing a great species. So don't ever think you're growing something which cannot be sold. I think in the near future, I can visualize uh, perhaps 20, 30 or 
2035. I don't know, I may not be around, but I'm sure that we would find our robustness also being treated as beautifully as we treat our arabicas in terms of price premium and returns to the farmer. Remember, your robusta can be used as provide the crema for your espresso cup. In fact, some of the barista championship, uh, they have used the robusta in their blend. And I think that is a very positive sign. In, uh, in fact, this year we gave it to Amsterdam when they were conducting their uh, barista championship. So you have the, the mouthfeel, the strength, the mouthfeel, the butteriness, the creaminess. Of course, all this depends on how you process and how, what care you take with your robusta. The third important, of course, everyone knows genetic research. It is used to, you know, to be crossed with these Arabica in order to give it, uh, uh, you know, a resistance to various pests and diseases. And uh, of course, the other important research is it can be used even as a standalone. I mean, that's something which is really shocking, I think, to many. But in India, we have been able to give it to Germany and they have produced it under the brand name of the farmer who has branded his coffee. The most famous is the Buttercup Gold and the uh, Badra Pearl, which are being sold as a standalone robusta, even with the face of the farmer as a caricature on the packet. And this has been going on for a couple of years. You can literally brand your coffee, you can prepare special coffees, you can prepare very innovative uh, uh, types of coffees which can suit uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, market. Remember that premium robustas can replace premium arabicas, especially because the robusta uh, is less expensive and remember the cost of production is also much lower than the arabica. And uh, of course, the last uh, point uh, that I would like to mention is for the, uh, the, I mean, before I talk about the promotion, I think there are three important aspects which uh, the producing origin should remember. We have to prepare standards for our coffee. Yes, CQI has standards, but I think each country should prepare their own standards because it could vary from country to country and the buyers accept it. So you have your standards. You need to have education and training to the farmers. I know Myanmar has been doing this and we in India have been doing this and we also ensure to keep a record of all that the farmer does from day to day. Remember that the brick meter is very useful to check the sugar content of the uh, robusta or the arabica. And lastly, ethics. We need to have ethics in whatever we do. Coming to promotion and marketing, I mean, we've never marketed our robusta like the arabica. We have the cup of excellence. I mean, every day you keep hearing about the cup of excellence and the high prices and the farmer satisfaction so we've never thought about having a platform for Robusta. Why not? Why can't we do that? I mean, that will energize the coffee producing countries of Robusta to prepare high quality. And here I appreciate Philippines when they presented their Robustas at the SDA that was held uh, recently. I mean, not recently, uh, a year ago. I mean, I keep thinking it was just the other day, but the coffees were really extremely nice. So we need to do promotion and marketing. So just to round off what I've been talking, I think we need to start with good plant material. We have to have good cultural practices. We need to have good uh, you know, processing techniques and if possible, a diversified pattern of cultivation. Like Uganda has bananas growing. We have pepper, we have fruits like oranges, avocados uh, growing along with our coffee. And we also need to process our coffee extremely well. We need to market our coffee and promote our quality coffee. Do remember that consumers have never rejected a quality robust. Thank you very much. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about the robust bean. Thank you. Thank you. Sunalini, there is a lot uh, to talk about uh, Robusta, I think, but you have mentioned so many uh, key words around this promotion, marketing, education. Um, I think that's the key. So uh, thank you so much, Sunalini. It has been amazing. So um, now we're going to hear Omar, our dear friend, founder of a chapter in Myanmar. Omar, the, the microphone is yours. Can you 
unmute yourself? Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, Mengalawa from Myanmar. Actually, I'm not an agricultural expert, but uh, I joined uh, this um, IWC to promote my robust from Myanmar. But uh, when I noticed that uh, there is uh, not much platform for robust so it is a great opportunity for me uh, when I discuss with Besita and Ms. Solani to make uh, this robust forum today. So uh, this is how I became an IWC mem chapter member here. So uh, when I discuss about the, my robusta, it is not, uh, how to say, agricultural expert point of view. This is all my experience throughout the uh, robusta trip. Uh, actually, I started coffee um, because of my commitment to the Cayenne state. But uh, the Cayenne people, <clears throat> the people there, they don't know what coffee it is. They just know that they want to sell coffee. So I said what coffee it is, and they didn't know. So that is why I try to invite the Ben Netherlands expert to find out the uh, um, varieties of coffee through the uh, Ministry of uh, Industry in 2016. And um, after that, uh, I tried to uh, make a research about the Robusta coffee in Cayenne State for SNV Netherlands. So uh, all these presentations represent with my findings throughout this uh, coffee trip. So uh, uh, can I share the screen for my presentation? Hello? Yes, how long a second, please? I'm gonna... Okay. Yes, can you please try if you can, you, yes. you can share? Yes, okay. So, uh, uh, we don't see your uh, screen. Okay. Can I see? No, I don't see it. Maybe backseat that. Oh, Rose, are you, uh, can you share my PowerPoint? Because I sent, mm. I sent one copy. Okay. okay. Okay, yeah. Now I got it. Okay, we got it. Thank you. So uh, this is when I when I I'm choosing my title about my presentation, I use uh, invisible coffee because uh, along my trip, I, whenever I try to talk with the other people in coffee industry, although I mean uh, we are talking about coffee, but it is not concerned with robusta. So when I try to discuss about challenges, strategy, marketing but it is not concerned with Robusta, then I feel I am invisible person. That is why my presentation name is called Invisible Coffee uh, from Myanmar. So it means that this is a Robusta. So while I'm trying to make a presentation, uh, I was trying to explain about introduction of coffee from Myanmar, Robusta presentation. So according to our history, the coffee was brought by the missionary during the British colonies. So when somebody asks me what varieties or where it is, uh, where the missionary, uh, where they brought the coffee, so the, because they would like to know the origin, but no record from Myanmar. So uh, I, we can just say that missionary brought the coffee to Myanmar. Then they make a they make a two coffee farm in Magui, uh, Division, and one coffee farm in Cayenne State. So uh, we can see that coffee Cayenne State is the first plate of coffee in Myanmar. So from this Cayenne State, it was 
move to the uh, southern Shan State, Kachin State, and Mandalay. Now it is in the, the whole region of Myanmar. So this is a Myanmar map. So when you see this map, this blue color is the uh, Arabica production area, and this red color is the Robusta production area. So uh, com even comparing with the uh, area, you will see the Arabica is more than the Robusta. So according to the statistics, uh, most of the people in the industry believe that Robusta is about 20% production in Myanmar. So when I'm trying to make this data source, my data source refer to some, some are from the uh, Myanmar Statistical Organization we call CSO, and also from Ministry of Agriculture, because they allow the coffee farm, they allow the land title to grow the coffee farm. But the people apply for the uh, approval, but they didn't grow coffee. So this data is the, uh, not the perfect, complete data yet. And also, I use some data from Myanmar Coffee Association. So it is also mainly come from the Myanmar Mandalay Coffee Group because they are the exporter of the specialty coffee, uh, Arabica coffee from Myanmar. So this data also did not represent the robust data. And uh, Myanmar also has a long border area to China and uh, Thailand, a lot of coffee that officially cannot export to the US and uh, other overseas, they were sent through the border trade to China and Thailand. So uh, some of the, these data cannot be available because uh, even we trying to export officially, the other side of the government didn't allow as a official import. So, that is why we cannot provide the official data for the border trade. So none of these data represent the complete data of Myanmar. I'm sorry to explain about that. Anyway, according to the data from the um, min uh, Ministry of Commerce, our coffee production is uh, about 8,010 yearly is including Arabica and Robusta and the growth of annual growth rate is a uh, 4% every year. So over 20,000 hectares were planted by coffee in 2016. So the exports of coffee is 535 tons to 860 making the income of 1,438 million from the coffee official export. So when we are talking about Robusta, I we find out that Cayenne State is the mainly Robusta production area. So uh, where is the Cayenne State? Cayenne State is uh, you will see here near the Nibiru and between the Yango. So four hours drive from Yango and it's more closer to Nibiru. But the coffee market, there is a no market for coffee. That is why all the coffee production from Cayenne State were sent to the border trade. So the altitude of that area is also over 1,260 meters. Therefore, both Arabica also plantable in that area, but uh, we still didn't know why most of the Robusta is produced there. One of the reasons is that this area is under the ethnic M groups until 2016-17 before the National Ceasefire Agreement. So uh, most of the coffee lands are under two governments. Uh, we, although we would like to apply for GAP or something for certificate, there's always a uh, problem in the land titles. 
which government owns or which certificate they own because uh, they were grow in the forest area outside of the village. So uh, this, this forest area is run by the ethnic government. So although this guy instead is produced, Robusta coffee, they trade the, uh, they make the trading in Dangu, but in the Bago regions. So uh, normally local people in that ethnic area, they drink coffee by themselves. So uh, there is a local consumption. So all the extra coffee are uh, sent to the border for the export. Since uh, although there is uh, no data how many uh, tens of robusta were produced according to the trading house, they say about 510 of robusta is exported through the time borders. So one of the uh, uh, good points in that area is that ethnic M groups uh, governed this area since very long time ago. They didn't allow any chemicals in that area. So they call this as an organic area. But on the other hand, although they said there is an organic area, actually they grow the coffee, but they never nurture the, uh, their own farm. So they, this is they call natural coffee. And when I arrived to that area in 2013, 2012, uh, for the other uh, civil society activities. At the times, the price of the coffee is very low. So uh, it's about the $1 per vis. But in this, this day, it's about $5 per vis. So there is uh, a lot of uh, improvement in that area. It is because this day, the area is uh, independent now and that the uh, National Ceasefire Agreement, and they're trying to make the H-Train program with the Shan State. And then they try, uh, as you see, Robusta is uh, harvest in January, February, later than the Arabica. So they're trying to take the reference market price to the Arabica. So this day, they, this year, they offered $5, uh, $5 per bus. So one of the challenges is uh, this, even this area is mainly grow robusta. The majority of the plants are over 25 years old. And there is no, therefore the jilbab tree is uh, become dropping from uh, Two hundred bits to uh, now is only one. But uh, because of the government awareness on the coffee from uh, coffee trade, uh, after the uh, after the uh, promotion by Wingrock International, the government has a plan to make an expansion of the coffee in Kenyan and. Sh and Chin State, but uh, there is no decision. They are going to expand Arabica or Robusta. So uh, in this moment, the people in that area have uh, two different ideas. Some people would like to maintain this area as a Robusta area, but some people would like to replace with the uh, Arabica, uh, like a Shan State. And on the other hand, they are the other cash crop is uh, five times they get a price in the market, which is uh, cardamom. So they will, because of this old tree, they would like to cut down the tree, uh, would like to replace with the uh, cardamom cash crop for the bet they are better in them. So the problem is they need a strategy, even if they would, would like to expand the uh, coffee plantation, how many ratio they are going to expand the uh, Robusta and Arabia. Uh,
In Kayan State, the main area of the uh, robust production area we call the Tandao. In Tandao, there's uh, three different groups. So all of these data came from the Ministry of Agriculture. So uh, the Tandao and Bokali, these two area is the uh, main robusta area, but this lake though we call in the middle is the uh, Arabica area. Since uh, robusta is a cross pollination and it's been long, long time ago, when I try to find out what kind of varieties in that area, nobody can say that. They just call this is the origin of Cayenne species. So there is no research data about what kind of varieties, is that specific varieties in that area. This is a Myanmar coffee export, total export from the Ministry of Myanmar Coffee Association. So in 2016, I tried to invite the um, Pan Netherlands expert to find out what is the uh, specific varieties of this uh, robusta. We tried to find out the other place, but he also cannot uh, get the solution. What varieties is really is? As you will see, uh, all these robusta trees are very tall. So finally, this day, after um, currently the Ministry of Agriculture is trying to promote these three species in that area. So in the, in the photo, behind the people is a cardamom, cardamom plants. So if they were replaced with the cardamom plants, this area will be the deforest very soon. This is a, one of the challenges in that area. Therefore, I made the value chain analysis for SNV. So if you would like to know more about the uh, paper, here's the link. Uh, you can uh, get the detailed research paper from that. As you see, uh, the, this is a reference from Myanmar time. You will see the robusta trees are very tall and very old. So uh, this is a transport situation in that area. All the robusta trees are growing in the deep slope of the mountains. They are also helping the environment from the landsliding and also to the weather. But very difficult for them to make a harvest or to make the transportation. So when we think about the same project as a robust uh, Arabica in Shan State, we cannot do it here. The main challenge is the transport and logistics. They could uh, transport only one bag uh, of the uh, commodities with a motorbike. So usually the people here are walking from one village to another. It takes about five hours to reach the, uh, one, another village. So uh, this is uh, one of the challenges, how to uh, improve their farming scale in that area. And another thing is the uh, scale labor in that area. Since this area is near the city, near the capital, and it extended to the uh, Thai border and China border, most of the young people migrate for their, their own job uh, throughout the year. So uh, only the old people, old women and old people are yeah, left in the village. And they are working in this, this deep slope of the mountains. So first time when we are trying to train them to pick the ripe cherry only, it's been very difficult for them. This old lady, she pick up the cherry by herself. So this is a processing. Some of the area is uh, very difficult to get the water access. So uh, dry nurture is their traditional farming, uh, traditional processing their area. But after, mix, after making some exchange program with the Shan State, some of the processor, they're trying to use the wash process, only a few people.
so uh, normally the collectors in you know, each day are the only one collector in each village. So they collect this dried cherry and they make a hauling with this uh, China make hala machines. And then they sell it to the city. At that time, the problem is they don't have the facility to separate their collected uh, coffee. So when they sell to the uh, trading house in the city, there is only three types of the uh, standards, green, green color beans or yellow color beans or mixed beans. So it is uh, one of the challenges to make a standard in that area because the China border accepted all this uh, coffee and then they prefer the yellow color. So uh, the people, the farmer doesn't want to make it busy. Uh, with the, uh, how to say, improvement of the uh, quality. So, um, but there is uh, only two or three roasting facility in the uh, area with the uh, traditional roasting method. So uh, very difficult to learn a roasting method in Myanmar. So uh, when I'm trying to learn a roasting, I firstly, I'm trying to learn from the uh, local manufacturer. So they teach me how to roast the coffee, but it is not specific. So uh, later, there is a Beulah company from Switzerland. They try to make the uh, demonstration of their machines. So uh, we, they, let, uh, they let us try to roast by ourselves. So we send the samples. And then they send the Indonesia coffee roaster expert. And she said, as soon as I deliver the sample, she's very surprised with my sample. Oh, the fragrance is very good. What type of coffee it is? When I say this is a Myanmar Robusta, she is surprised. I've never seen Robusta such a small seed. So this is one of the challenges for me. Whenever I try to promote the Myanmar Robusta in other country, comparing with the sea, Myanmar Robusta is smaller than the others. So when I try to, I know Vietnam is a very famous for Robusta, but uh, whenever I have the chance, I would like to learn their feedback. So I try to join the um, Danan Expo in 2017. And I try to make a friend with the uh, local traders. So uh, I didn't sell, I just give them the, how to say, present, and we just make a coffee uh, meeting. And then they were very surprised with the fragrance and taste of the uh, coffee. So when I explained that this is an organic coffee, they are very keen to import. So they said they are going to make a contract. Omar, I would like to get one ton every year, uh, every month. But as you see, Myanmar, can, uh, Myanmar quantity is, robust quantity is 500 ton only. So, uh, and another thing is, uh, is there any certificate? So they are asking for the labeling because this is we call the Robusta. Until now, the local people, they were very proud. They are Robusta as an organic, but nobody has the certificate. This is a one of the problem in Myanmar. Anyhow, I trying to uh, introduce with the uh, other buyer and then I will, one of the Korea business person visit to my house and they send a sample to uh, Korea and they test it. And then they said the feedback, oh my, this is like a start back. So we would like to import your brand. So this is one of the, my successful story uh, along my experience for promoting a Myanmar robot star in the market. So, but uh, this year because of the COVID, uh, Korea also seriously affected uh, by the uh, COVID. So uh, this year I cannot export uh, Myanmar Robusta. So these previ previous slides are only about the, uh, how to say, story. This is a fact, the statistic that you can see. This uh, This picture is a certificate uh, for the quality. And this is, this is the list. 
Uh, there is the Mr. Marcelo, uh, who is work for the Mandalay Coffee Group, and uh, he stationed in Pien uh, Ulen a few years ago. So we trying to send a sample of this robust stuff from Tandao to him and to test it for the cupping school. You will see, he has a, a lot of, uh, some people, they got over 90. And a lot of things, a lot of uh, robusta, they receive uh, over 80 marks. So uh, the people are now more proud of their robusta. But this is a certificate from them. But the still, we cannot find the markets for the fine robusta. So uh, local people are now confused whether they are going to produce Robusta or Arabica in that area. And do they need to improve their harvesting processing scale if they cannot get the, uh, how to say, good price for the fine Robusta while they are going to busy uh, to improve their quality, something like that. And uh, as part of the one of the expansion plan, this uh, Yuma strategy is also uh, trying to take the pilot uh, plantation in the uh, AOD division. It is uh, near the Nguisan Beach. It is uh, harvesting in 2018, last year, and the quality also very uh, high enough. So uh, now people are interested to grow more robusta in Myanmar. So these are the key uh, player in the Robusta program that you can see later. So according to the Ministry of Agriculture, Myanmar is trying to expand 200,000 200, acres by 2030. And they are expected to export 60,000 tons a year. This and they start expanded uh, coffee plantation, but according to statistics, you will see that uh, Guyan states uh, in the Guyan state, although they try to supply the uh, nursery plants for robusta and arabica, but many people try to use the arabica instead of the robusta. So there is uh, challenges of the uh, danger of the robusta. Uh, for the extension in the Akayan state. So, uh, sorry, uh, Omar, I don't want to interrupt you, but I, I would like to ask you, please mind the time. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, I'm almost finished. So, this is uh, one of the challenges uh, for the robust in this day because of the old trees. Um, aging trees, we are going to replace with the new plants. So whether we are going to uh, plant Robusta or Arabica in that area. So if we are going to improve this quality uh, uh, quality for fine Robusta, is there a market? Otherwise, the people are going to replace with the other cash crop, then there will be a danger of the deforestation and also the effect of the climate change quickly in that area. So uh, this is uh, why I'm here to discuss about the Robusta in the Robusta group, how we are going to make uh, quality standardization in the same area because uh, ASEAN has a uh, quality standard differently, but uh, there is uh, no quality standard in Myanmar and also there is no reference data in the region. And whether we are going to find the market for fine Robusta and how big it is, this is uh, one of the questions from the uh, local farmers. Uh, thank you. And then it will be the invisible coffee from Myanmar in future. Okay, thank you so much, Omar. This is very interesting, and uh, uh, we we can talk further about this. And as uh, Sunalini mentioned, there is very important the each that each country should uh, uh, set their standards. 
Okay, uh, thank you so much. We're gonna listen now to Doreen from Uganda. Doreen, I will share your presentation. Tell me if you can see it, please. I haven't seen it. Yeah, it's coming. Yeah, and yeah, you tell me you tell me when you want to uh, to change the slide. You you can get it started. Thank you, Doreen. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I would want to thank IWCA International for bringing us together as Robusta producers in different countries and different continents so that we speak about a topic which is uh, very, um, which, which is very uh, passionate about, uh, which is straight to our heart. Uh, Uganda, we are very pr privileged and we thank you for this opportunity. Um, the outline of my presentation, um, I'll present about robusta growing in Uganda, robusta marketing, the importance of coffee to the Uganda's economy, Uganda's position in the global market, and I'll talk briefly about the women involvement in the coffee sector in Uganda. And uh, lastly, I talk about how you can reach out to us and you source this beautiful coffee that you grow here. Yes, Uganda is a country in East Africa. It is uh, in East Africa, it's astride the equator. On the west, we border with the Democratic Republic of Congo. On the north, we have Southern Sudan. To the east, we border with Kenya. To the, to the south, we border with Tanzania and Rwanda. Yes, um, Uganda is, uh, is privileged to be the home of Robusta Coffee, which if everybody is talking about today, as Ethiopia is to Arabica. Um, Uganda has been with this Robusta and it's still, some of it is still in the wild and it was found naturally growing in the Lake Victoria Crescent. That is where we got seven lions which we first grew, but they were attacked by a wilt at one time and then now we are trying to, we have developed 10 lions which are coffee wilt resistant uh, varieties. Uh, right now, we are implementing a roadmap given to us by government, and we are currently trying to move from 4.7 million bags of production of export to 20 million bags by 2025. Uh, this one we are doing by popularizing the growing of coffee um, through smallholders and through the big plantations. Uh, the picture which Blanca has put there is of one of our members on the left. She's called Mrs. Ruthie Singoma. Uh, she's tending to her Robusta coffee deep southwestern Uganda. The second, um, the second uh, picture that we have is the coffee which grows in banana plantations in Uganda. And I didn't tell you this, Uganda is a very big producer of bananas and also a consumer of bananas. We consume them throughout the day. Breakfast, lunch, and the dinner is bananas. Uh, Blanca, can we go behind? No, behind on the other, yes. Again, yes. Yeah, coffee is uh, grown by smallholders and it's grown at a very high altitude, which ranges between 900 to 1,000 meters above sea level. This is where we grow our Robusta. And uh, to tell you, Uganda produces 80% uh, Robusta and 20% Arabica. Uh, we have very many varieties uh, since Uganda is a home of Robusta, 56 indigenous varieties. And currently we produce and export around 3.3 .3 million bags of Robusta. Let's move. Yes, move again. Yes, and uh, as you saw on the map, Uganda is astride the equator. We have a big part which is north of the equator, and we have some part which is south of the equator. This makes us a very uh, important producer because we can produce coffee throughout the year. So 
people who want to source coffee from Uganda, you can get it anytime, any 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 day, because where the season is main, the next part of the year it is a fly crop. So we have coffee throughout the year. Can we move? Yes, uh, Uganda exports uh, robusta in different grades. And the main grades that we export now are screen 18, screen 17, screen 15, and screen 12. And most of our coffee is destined to the European Union. Uh, the second biggest importer of our coffee is the Sudan. Uh, we have uh, most of our coffee, uh, robusta coffee is nachos and mostly they are they are done by floating the cherries and drying them on raised beds. We have a small component of washed robusta, which we are trying to develop right now. Uh, we have imported in machines and we are trying to popularize it with our uh, farmers and we are training them on how to wash uh, robusta and, and they develop, we are developing the fine robustas. Uh, in 2020, 2010, sorry, um, we are privileged to work with CQI and we developed the fine robusta protocols in Uganda. I would like to recognize the contribution of uh, Sunalini Menon. Uh, she was part of the group which was in Uganda and we worked together and we developed the uh, fine robusta protocols which are in use around the world. And we are trying to use them to train our people to see that they produce robustas to fit in this category. Small. Yes, uh, as you can see on the right, we have uh, a picture of uh, coffee, which is uh, on drying. And uh, these are farmers from southwestern Uganda, and they do drying uh, of naturals direct in the sun, but on raised uh, beds and they select, selectively pick the red cherries. And this coffee is marketed as a fine robusta. Uh, I had told you before, our coffee is high altitude grown and it expresses a sweet neutral and a taste and it's good for espressos. And uh, because of uh, our popularity in the espresso market, most of our coffee is destined to Italy. Uh, our coffee has large bold beans. We have screen 18, uh, around 8 to 11 percent is screen 18, and it's good for the whole bean market. And uh, interestingly, our coffee uh, has a good acidity, and it has a good body, and it has the sweetness and its bitterness. Though chlorogenic acids are there, as uh, Mrs. Menon had said but its, it's uh, bitterness is masked by the sweetness that we have. Yes, Yeah, um, Uganda embarked on uh, characterizing our coffees according to the agroecological zones, because Uganda has different zones. We have the low altitude areas, we have the medium, we have the high altitude zones, and we are trying to see whether these growing conditions affect the coffee. And we are trying to make the, the descriptors for the coffees in each of the agroecological zones. So that when we are marketing the coffees, we market them according to the zones and the buyers will have the opportunity to buy the coffee which has specific flavor notes that they need in their blends. So this map shows the uh, different agroecological zones. Yes, um, these are different uh, pie charts that we, uh, that we generated from the cuttings that we have done for over around four years. And you can, as you can see, uh, different pie charts, they have different dominant um, different dominant flavor notes. Uh, this uh, northeastern savanna grassland coffee, we see it has uh, a lot of caramel, chocolatey, and spicy. And when we move to the Lake Victoria Crescent, um, 
we see it has most mostly chocolate and caramel. Can we move, please? Yes, uh, the choga plains coffee is mainly caramel also and chocolate. And uh, the coffee from the northwestern savanna grasslands is almost balanced. It is having all the flavor notes present there. Spicy, nutty, caramel, and chocolatey. Can we move again? Yeah, uh, coffee from the pastoral rangelands uh, is uh, more of chocolatey and caramel. And uh, uh, the west, western savanna grasslands, it's chocolatey and caramel. Uh, it has some tropical fruits and flowers, but they are not very well pronounced. Yes, we have also coffee from southwestern farmlands, and this coffee is dominantly chocolatey and caramel. Uh, it has other flavor notes, but they are not very well pronounced. And I would like to inform you that uh, this is a project which is still ongoing. As you can see, some of the some of the flavor notes uh, we have not well refined them. Uh, we are going to share this data with more, more people who have uh, the statistical bit, and we are going to do more intensive cuttings to confirm these flavor notes before we produce a coffee map for Uganda. Can we move. Yeah. Um, Efforts done by women, as I had told you, um, the chairperson of International Women in Coffee Uganda chapter. And on this, we are doing some work with women to see that they, uh, that they do a contribution or they take this opportunity to produce the coffees. As you know, women are very good at detail and they know how to handle things properly. So we've been doing advocacy for them to the government to see that they focus on them and they give them trainings. And we also do for them marketing of the coffees, either nationally or internationally. Um, because of this, uh, we have uh, done some capacity building and um, I'm happy to see that on this forum, I saw a lady called Mrs. Wandera. Uh, she's working with us to see that she promotes her coffee from central Uganda to the uh, US market. Uh, the, we have other women groups. Uh, one is Kimco, one is Zigoti Coffee Works, and they are working very hard to see that they float their coffee and they dry them within the good protocols to see that it fits into the fine robusta market. Uh, we, have, um, we have seen uh, medium farmers who are coming into, into the farming business and they are now uh, installing wet mills on their, on their farms and they are processing coffee, which is for the Robusta coffee fine market. And this coffee is mainly destined to South Korea and Japan. Uh, in, if you want to reach us, which you should, because the coffee is there, 3.3 million bags of Robusta coffee, uh, you can send information to us through the uh, the contacts below. One is for Uganda Coffee Development Authority, which is info at ugandacoffee.go.ug. Or you can reach us through the IWCA Uganda chapter, and the, and the, and the email is info at iwcauganda.org. Or you can pass through the global chapter, which is uh, www.womeninkoffee.org. Uh, at womeninkoffee.org. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doreen. And I, I invite any questions. Thank you so much. We, what we are going to do, we are taking note of comments and questions, and as soon as we finish, we will um, uh, give acts. We will follow up with that, okay? If that is okay with you. Thank you. Blanca, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, good. I'm just testing. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'm okay. I'm so sure. may I have the honor to introduce Bettina? Yes, please. 
Yes, so uh, hello everyone. Uh, I have to choose between my video and audio. So uh, I'm Pasita, there I am. Uh, I'd like to uh, make special introduction to uh, somebody from the Philippines who we're very proud of because she is the first uh, Q grader in Robusta. Am I right, uh, Bea? And in a place that is the second largest producer of Robusta coffee in the Philippines. So we have, uh, she is an R uh, Q grader Robusta. Uh, her name is Bettina Grace Bellardo. So Bea, you can uh, proceed. You have the mic now. Uh, Blanca, please unmute her. All right. Okay. Can you hear me all? <laughs> yes. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm very much grateful with um, IWCA Philippines for always inviting me to this, this gatherings, always, I think. Um, okay, I'm going to share with you how is, how is Robusta going here in my region. Um, so I am from Cavite province in the Philippines. Um, it's, it used to be one of the largest producer of Robusta coffee along with Batangas. Um, for everyone's information, uh, Philippines has been um, a Robusta process, processing country and it used to have um, approximately 85% of its production dedicated only to Robustas. Um, so when, that was when, that was during the late 80s until the 90s, okay. Um, Robusta is known in the Philippines for, for the production of soluble coffee. I think it still is. Uh, because uh, what I noticed is that Arabica is still the choice of beverage for the for the brewers and the the coffee shops here in the Philippines. So in 2019, um, there there has been an increase of 4.8 4.8 in production of robustas. So um, overall. It was a 72% robusta, robusta, pro, uh, robusta production in the Philippines. Um, that was already a decline in production with comparison into the 80s and 90s. Um, one of the reasons is that there has been a, a conversion of land generally, especially in my region. I can, I can see the conversion of land here. Okay, in my region, in Cavite, we generally do naturals, but farmers are already um, experimental with honeys. Um, about three years ago, we also, we also did some honey robustas, um, which yield a very, very nice uh, profile. It brought out, um, good acidities which which you can compare with the arabicas okay okay so what i already mentioned that uh we produce okay i already mentioned that we we are producing our robustas naturally however um, we also have been unintentionally doing fermentation through keeping the coffee sacks overnight, which I think brought out the, the depth and the, the body of the robustas. However, also, one of the challenges are that um, farmers here in my area are lack, uh, lack tools, lack tools for measuring like the pH levels for the temperature and the length of fermentation. So generally, generally what they do is very, very traditional compared to that of 
in Mindanao, the southern region of the Philippines. Um, they were really very, um, they were very, hello, okay. Yes, we can hear you, Bettina. Yeah, proceed. Okay. okay. Um, co with comparison to Mindanao, they are already one of the large. They are already the largest producing region, not only with robustas but with, as well as the Arabicas. Um, they are very. Did we lose her? No. Bettina, we can hear you. Can you hear us, Bettina? Hello? We can hear you, Bettina. We are okay. That's the Philippines for you. Uh, sometimes our, our internet is really a little wonky. And uh, uh, Bettina, are you okay? Um, hello. Yeah, okay. I think, I think, yes. Okay, just to compare with the robustas of, of that of Mindanao and in my region, I think they are very um, intricate when it comes to the processing of their robustas as well as not only with the processing, but as well as with the harvesting. Here in Cavite, there are very there are uh, a lot of challenges that came this year because of one one because of the um, eruption of the volcano, which is near our our area. Um, going back, just to compare with the with the profiles of robusta. Um, I think Mindanao robustas are very uh, has a very bright acidity um, with low bitterness compared um, comparing to our robustas that has that are still more roasty that has more roasty notes and roasted nuts um, to be specific and Sulu Mindanao Sulu yes has more um, fruit, fruity notes. Um, so yes, I think that's all I can share with you. Okay, thank you so much, Bettina. Um, uh, Pasita, would you like to add anything else? Because this is a very interesting topic. We all know that uh, Robusta has a lot of opportunities in the, during the last years. Uh, there are uh, some organizations like CQI and SEA trying to support the promotion and the position of uh, the good qualities of the Robustas. And we have seen also that other countries uh, have already uh, started doing that, not only in Africa, in Asia, also in the Americas. Uh, um, Brazil also is doing a lot of work with that, Ecuador, uh, in my country, in Guatemala as well. So I, I'm, I'm really uh, looking forward to uh, see more of the Robusta in the market. I see a comment here from Emma that she says that it's still a struggle to find, uh, find Robustas in the UK for example, and it, it's a little bit frustrating. And uh, I know that that is, for those who already know the, the value and the beauties of the Robustas, it's, uh, it's a still a struggle, but let's keep on going on that and taking note on everything. So Pasita, would you like to add anything else before we close your here? Yes, I think uh, if I may share about, uh, I wish we could show the map of the Philippines, but I was telling uh, Bettina earlier today because uh, we gave her a few samples from different parts of the country. I think I also have a theory that maybe the variety in that southernmost part of the Philippines probably came from Malaysia or Indonesia. 
that is my my guess because it's so different. I'm not a Q grader, but when she told me the results of her copying, and I, I think Sunalini might think of the same as Doreen is saying the north, the south, the west, the east, they really are all different because of the influences in these different areas. So I'm very proud to have a lot of Robusta areas in the Philippines. And I think IWCA can very well promote uh, this, uh, you know, different origins. And we can already see the positive response from buyers. And this is exactly why when, when Sunalini told us that she liked the Robustas. Of course, she also likes the Indian Robustas as well as Ugandas. But <laughs> look at her laughing. But, you know, for us in the Philippines where people always thought of Robusta as soluble coffee, mm. it is very challenging to now promote the fine Robustas. But we have managed to increase prices to almost double of what soluble companies used to buy it for. And if that is a sign of, you know, a ray of hope, I hope that the other Robusta producers, uh, Doreen, Sunalini, and uh, Omar, your, your, your invisible Robusta might suddenly become visible. I really think that it takes a united effort of IWCA at least to start with, uh, with our thanks to CQI, of course, for helping us uh, discover the fine robusta. So now we have, you know, in the Philippines, we even have, uh, you know, uh, Omar, you might be jealous, but we have more Q graders and we have R graders already. So uh, you may want to talk to CQI again to increase that number in, in Myanmar. And I am so happy because I have been to all four countries. I mean, of course, I'm from the Philippines. I've been to Uganda. I've seen the banana and coffee combination, Doreen. I haven't seen the coffee farms in, in India, but I have seen Pinolwin in, in Myanmar. So I can so relate to everything that all the speakers are saying, and I'm very, very happy. So, uh, and, and, uh, if, uh, thank you. I, I just would like to add that through IWCA and the direct system, trade system that we are um, uh, creating uh, th uh, through the coffee availability list and all the efforts that we're doing, of course, we do include Robusta. Actually, uh, we were planning to have our copying session uh, in April with Sunalini. She was going, she was invited to uh, support us actually for having a special copying session for Robusta. And she kindly accepted that that uh, will be on hold. And hopefully we will have that coming anytime soon. Um, Omar, we have a, we have a, a question for you. It's about the price um, of your coffee. If you had a good offer for your coffee, a good price. And we have someone here who would like, who raised the hand and would like to address also. We will give you a minute, sir. Please hold on there. Yes, Omar. Yes, um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for question. Um, as you see, uh, whenever you're trying to promote the Robusta, everybody uh, said this is a dirty words, right? So it's same for me. That is why when this uh, Korean business person uh, offer me the chance, uh, he would like to promote the, my brand. Uh, he's not buying the coffee. He would like to promote the Korean coffee brand in uh, Korea. So I think uh, this is a good opportunity for uh, Myanmar Robusta. Therefore, I accept it. And when mm. we discuss about the uh, price, uh, they said that they are going to start the branding in Korea. So they also cannot, how to say, offer the high price. But uh, from my side also, if there is a buyer, I'm so happy. So I try to calculate my costs. And uh, I try to offer the same price with the local. So I sell my coffee, 100 gram of coffee powder at $1 FOB price. I don't know how the other uh, country, 
I have, uh, yeah, I have, I, I have the same question for Doreen. Uh, what would be the average of selling prices of Robusta in Uganda? For example, what do the farmers get on average per kilo, Doreen? Doreen? Yeah. yeah um, Please unmute her, Blanca. Yes, I'm trying to do that. Okay. Doreen, can you yes. unmute yourself? Okay, yeah. I have, I have. Okay. Yes, uh, thank you for that question. Um, on average, uh, the farmer gets around 1.2 US dollars for the Robusta. And uh, um, yes, that is it. And uh, we, in Uganda, we, are, we have a very, very um, advanced um, marketing system, which makes the farmer benefit because every day the farmer knows what is on the international prices because we send the prices on the SMS of all the service providers for the telephones. So the farmers can know before they sell their coffee. As long as their coffee is clean and is dry, uh, they can always know and negotiate the price that they would want from their coffee. So the farmer gets around 1.2 USD mm -hmm. okay. for their clean coffee. Yeah. Thank you. So Bodhi, uh, you raise your hand. Would you like to make any question or a comment? I'm gonna try to, okay. I'm trying to unmute you. Okay. I'm not I'm not able to unmute you, sir. So I don't know. If you would like to make I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that. Maybe you can just put it in the chat box. Yes. And, and we're we're like yes. this is like seven oh five. I think we're running. It's okay. Over he said it's two. okay. Okay. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Pasita and Sunalini and Omar and Doreen and Bettina and Francisca's uh, all and watching. I know. I know. We have a lot of people joining us this morning. We have. Uh, we we had thirty seven people joining us. So I'm I'm very happy and really looking forward to have another webinar like this. Thank you so much, Pasita, for the for the idea. Kelim, I don't know if you would like to add anything else, but um, uh, yes, let's keep on going. Uh, this is this is great. So, is it goodbye for now? Yes, I think so. Unless uh, Kelim, would you like to say anything? We cannot hear you. Okay. okay next time we will next time we will try uh the, webex or uh, the or go to meeting we we can try the go to meeting too but this is, has been great so everything was very okay. positive thank you so much pasita i don't know what thank you everyone okay thank you so much and have a nice working week keep safe okay bye 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 thank you oh let's have a photo uh blanca Blanca, on oh, yes, 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 on yes, yes. Gold, can you take a photo, please? Uh, so it has to be in two shots because, uh, as you know, we can only fit 25 on the screen. And okay, everybody's smiling. So uh, I think we can have more of this, Blanca, in the coming, in the coming weeks. So stand by. This is very good. Ah, you want... To hold the cup. Thank you, Bodhi, for coming. Thank you to everyone. Okay. Uh, good day to you, Blanca, and good evening to everyone else. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.